Well, good afternoon from Cooperstown, New York. We welcome you to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, this is a special edition of our virtual Voices of the Game series. Uh, we're very glad that you could all join us as we uh, fast approach the Christmas and New Year's holidays coming up. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus and I work in the education department. And today it'll be my pleasure to talk to Ken Kendrick, owner of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, he has been a member of the Hall of Fame's Board of Directors since 2020. And he is uh, certainly one of the elite baseball card collectors in the world, has one of the greatest personal collections of baseball cards. We'll be talking about uh, all of these things uh, with Ken Kendrick, who joins us today, uh, presumably from Arizona, where I'm sure it's slightly warmer. Ken, welcome to the program and welcome to the Hall of Fame. Well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, yeah, I am in Arizona. It's not one of our better days, but it's uh, it's comfortable. How's that? <laughs> well, when you say it's not one of your better days, that would be one of our best days in the winter. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> our better days this time of year is uh, uh, 70, uh, no clouds in the sky. Uh, it's a little uh, cloudy in the 60s. <laughs> I'll take it. We're going to talk a lot today, Ken, about something I love, and I know that you love it, and that is baseball cards, baseball card collecting. And the centerpiece of our conversation is this terrific new book. It's the Diamondbacks Collection, 50 of the Greatest Cards in Sports Collecting History. So there are other sports represented. Obviously, we're going to focus on the baseball cards. The book is authored by Tom and Ellen Zapala. Tom has been a guest on our program before. But you also contributed mightily uh, to the book uh, with uh, some of your thoughts on uh, the baseball cards featured in the book. The book is available at our uh, Hall of Fame shop. And if you want to go to it online, it's uh, very simple. Just write it down, shop.baseballhall.org. Again, shop.baseballhall.org. That'll take you to the shop, put in the Diamondbacks collection, and the book will come up. Also, we want to let people know that if you buy a Hall of Fame gift membership, you'll receive a complimentary copy of this beautiful coffee table book. As I said, the book features some of the finest cards in the collection that Ken Kendrick has amassed over the years. Ken, exactly how did this book project come about? How did it get started? Well, I have known uh, Tom and Ellen for uh, for some years. They they've put a series of you know, uh, of books out, uh, uh, coffee table books like this is uh, that honor baseball and all the legends of the game in different ways. And so I've you know I've seen I've seen their work before, and they reached out to me actually almost three years ago now, uh, maybe a little more now that I think about it. Uh, uh, about the idea of featuring uh, uh, the, uh, the cards that are at the high end of my collection and that they thought it would make a book. And uh, so we, uh, you know, we talked about doing it. Then we got interrupted, unfortunately, by the, uh, uh, the pandemic and things got delayed, but finally we were able to get it uh, uh, going and it got published uh, uh, actually in time for this year's uh, national sports card uh, collection collectors uh, 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 event, which was at, at Atlantic City. So the book was released in July of this year. As I mentioned before, you're not the author of the book, but you obviously contributed to it by sitting down with the authors. How long did that process take? You said it was three years overall, but in terms of sitting yeah, down uh, with uh, the 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 time I I had to spend on this was was not significant. Um, uh, to be fair, the the real heavy lifting was done by by Tom and Ellen and others. And um, uh, my organization, uh, where the cards are the cards are kept in a vault uh, that are in this book, and we helped them uh, 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 via the Diamondbacks with doing high high resolution uh, photographs, which appear in the book. And then I did, uh, you know, some reviewing of things that they were writing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a, you know, kind of a backstory in there about me as a collector. There's a story about my colleague that works for the Diamondbacks, longtime collector, who 
really helped me in a very significant way in the early days with the collection that is in the book, Tom Candiotti, mm. a name known to most baseball fans, a great player in his day and now broadcaster for the D-backs. So he was involved, I was involved, but really most of the work was Tom and Ellen and then Joe Orlando participated um, and, and, and others uh, who are, you know, the typical team of people who do uh, uh, do a publication. The book is broken down to a, into a number of chapters. Chapter one is the story behind your collection. Chapter two, you go into the best of the best, uh, the cards that you feel are at the top of the list. Chapter three is the rest of the best. You then have breakdowns by chronology, the pre-war legends cards from 1900 to 1935, the golden boys, 35 to 53, uh, then you have Mr. Tiger to the Wizard, a reference to Al Kaline and Ozzy Smith, and that's 1954 <laughs> to 1980. Now, you started collecting in the 50s, correct? I did. Uh, my uh, very first cards that I ever acquired, uh, uh, I was, uh, it was the, by, by good fortune, um, for those who are uh, involved in the collecting world, one of the iconic sets of baseball cards of all time is the 1952 top set. Mm. And as an eight-year-old, uh, those were the cards that were in the market at the time. And, you know, I began to collect then. My friends and I would, uh, on a Saturday, as I remember it well, it seems like yesterday, we would march from our uh, little community down to the downtown area where there was a five and 10 cent store. And at their candy counter, they had baseball cards for sale. And we would buy, We our moms would give us a quarter and we would each buy five packs of cards. Uh, they were a nickel a pack. Mm. You got five cards and you got a piece of gum and we would open them all. Uh, we would stuff our mouths with gum and we would march home uh, trading the cards along the way. And that's how it started. Ken, when did you first venture into the vintage cards, those those early tobacco cards? Did that come much later? Yeah, that came way, way, way later in, 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 in my adult uh, life um, in in the really it started you know in in the late nineties basically uh, mm -hmm. that you know I I had evolved in my life situation uh, from uh, many years of active duty in a in a technology company that I founded in the late sixties and then uh, moved to Arizona in the early nineties. And, and we, of course, started the Diamondbacks, became a major league team in 98. And in and around that time, I began to, to look more at vintage cards, more at cards that had obviously become valuable. And, and uh, I then um, uh, was introduced to Tom Candiotti, who, who had been a very avid collector while he he had been a player and then later in the broadcasting and sort of that got me really going to understand the, uh, uh, the vintage card world and, and, uh, you know, what were the important cards? You, you kind of instinctively know who some of the important players are, but I learned through that era of late nineties into the early two. So going back 20 plus years ago, really is when I began to acquire cards that, have ultimately become, you know, quite valuable. We're going to highlight some of the baseball cards in the book. Uh, the book is beautifully photographed, wonderful reproductions uh, through photographic imagery of these cards. Uh, one of the older cards featured is this one, a ah, yes. top card that was part of the Turkey Red set. Uh, I love the name. This was not a turkey product. This was not a meat product. This was a cigarette company. Tell us uh, right. about the significance historically of this card. It's one of the more famous ones. Yeah, the, the, uh, of course, that particular card is unique in, in a multiple of ways. It's, these are the portrait level cards that were only produced, as far as I'm aware, uh, once mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, 1911 era. Uh, when the T206s were prominent uh, uh, cards that are, again, one of the more iconic sets of cards uh, are, you know, the, the, the T206s that were produced over several years, then the Turkey Reds in 1911, 
Gaudi in the 30s uh, became iconic, and then the tops uh, were third. But the turkey reds, you know, were uh, oversized compared to any other baseball cards that are out there, any sports cards, as far as I know. And it's just a unique set of cards. And I have this, uh, very proud to have this Ty Cobb card, which is kind of the the key card in that set. And I have it as is my whole model of how I've collected. I've tried to get the highest of grade in each card that I collect. That's just kind of a model that I adopted. And the Turkey Red Ty Cobb is, fits that model. But, you know, those were cards that were, you had to, you couldn't go and buy them. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you had to send in, as I uh, remember reading, you had to be a preferred customer and then you had to send in something to the company and then you got one of these cards. Hmm. How large exactly are these cards? How, uh, how large? Yeah. Um, uh, probably, a, a, you know, mo most people own, uh, own a cell phone and iPhone. They're, they're, they're probably, I'm looking here at my iPhone and, and I don't have the card in front of me. It's somewhat larger than a iPhone, but, uh, not grammatically larger, where most cards are smaller than an iPhone. It really looks like a painting. Yeah, it's it's beautifully done. I mean, it's a uh, it's a set of cards that I didn't attempt to collect. I mean, it goes back more than a hundred years, uh, but I wanted to have some representation of it in my collection. And of course, my model was to get the best of the best if I could, and. Fortunately, I was able to acquire this highest graded uh, uh, turkey red uh, Ty Cobb. And Ty Cobb was the key player in that set, the most prominent player of his era. And his card would be the most treasured of cards from that set. Ken, how exactly did you acquire this card? How did I acquire it? Yeah. You know, I had um, uh, over, over many years, I have come to know many prominent dealers around the country from coast to coast. And, and for those who are collectors that may be on this call, you know, these are the folks that run the online auctions and, and, uh, uh, and are very prominent in the national show. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I was uh, engaged, uh, have been engaged with a number of them. And, and on this one, I think one of those dealers called me and, Actually, he had a set of turkey reds, as I recall it, mm. that someone owned privately that had come to him about selling it. And he connected with me privately. And, and I thought about buying the entire set and ultimately ended up buying this one card. And I've had it, you know, 15 to 20 years, I would guess. I don't know the exact date. Are you able to display this in your home? Um. I, I generally do not. These cards, basically because of the value of them, uh, just can't be left out. <laughs> and, and so they're, they're stored uh, uh, normally in a vault. And then, on a, I mean, this particular card, as all the others, have been displayed in my home. Um, you know, I've had, I, I've done a, a, a good amount of work with the collection in raising money for charity and and helping not for profits and so i've had some events uh where 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 this card and others uh were uh you know were i beg your pardon for the phone um in any event uh uh you know i have had it out on occasion and it's been on display well actually it was on display at that uh you know the hall of fame museum when my entire collection going back some years was uh was on loan to to uh Cooperstown to the hall of fame. And then I've had, had the cards on uh, loans to other museums. And then I've done events uh, for uh, various other organizations. So it's periodically in the public eye, but mostly it sleeps quietly in a vault. <laughs> Let's say you have a famous baseball person come over. Will you typically bring some of these cards out for them to see? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the elite collection, I, I I'm like a lot of collectors. Uh, I have many, many, many thousands of cards. Uh, you're seeing 50 of a very, very, a needle of a haystack, but this happens to be, maybe it's better said, it's a piece of gold uh, hidden in the haystack, the 50 cards being the gold. 
And so I bring them together, uh, all 50 of them uh, on occasion and, and, and do a little uh, presentation, talk about the cards, let people handle them, pass them around. Because as, as everyone who collects knows, they're in hard plastic cases yeah. and you know, are authenticated and graded by PSA. All of my cards are PSA authenticated and graded. And, and so, you know, I, I do allow people to kind of get close up and personal with the cards in those settings and uh, love doing it. The next card we're going to showcase is one uh, I'm very familiar with. We actually have a program that we teach here. We do it through virtual field trips. It's popular culture through baseball cards. And one of the cards we talk about in that educational unit is this one, the 1933 Gowdy. Uh, Babe Ruth. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the collectors out there are very familiar with it. Beautiful card produced by the Gowdy Gum Company. One thing yeah. I've always been curious about this, was this originally a black and white photograph that was colorized or do we know if it was a drawing from the start? You know, I honestly don't know. Uh, I, it, 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 it is colorized. This is obvious. Was it colorized from a photo I do not know for sure. My guess is probably it was, but it's it's really, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I'm being a little repetitive, but it is one of the three uh, uh, in the history of collecting uh, in baseball and uh, uh, baseball cards. You know, it is one of the three most iconic uh, sets of cards, the 33 Gowdies. And in that set, you're showing one. There were actually three Babe Ruth cards in that Mm -hmm. uh, said in, in my collection, I do have all three of them and I'm proud that I have all three of them in the highest possible grade, which is again, my mantra of what I try to achieve. I haven't been hundred percent successful in getting the highest graded card of each of the cards I have, but I mostly have them. And, uh, this one was one of the three roofs in that set. Ken, how difficult is it to find the Gaudi cards? Oh, no, there really you know it's things. interesting. Yeah, uh, it, because the '30s are not way as far long ago. It's a long time ago, to be fair. Almost 80 years, or, or almost 90 years, I guess. Uh, the you know the Gaudis are out there. Um, uh, uh, they were the first cards. By the way, uh, you, you maybe said it. I, I know this. They uh, the early era of, of cards were tobacco cards. And the Gowdies in 1933 were the first gum cards right. uh, that were ever produced. And then, of course, gum took over, uh, tobacco waned. Uh, and and uh, uh, in any event, the Gowdy Gum Company, I believe it was called, produced this set of cards. Uh, and and they're, uh, uh, you know, if you're an active uh, acquirer or an active participant in the auction world, there are often Gowdy cards available. Yeah. Uh, the the availability is different than the quality. You know, there there are lots and like I have a set of 1934 Gaudi cards, a complete set of every single card. Uh, they are mid grade. Uh, to get an elite graded set of Gaudis is very very challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some, and the elite set would be like you know, on the scale of one to ten, the grading models that we, uh, those who collect know, um, a, a, a grade eight Gaudi is, is rare. Uh, yeah. there, you know, you can go and look, of course, there's these guides online to tell you how many cards have ever been graded in each grade that, you know, every, every set of cards virtually ever produced. And you go and you will see there are very few eights or nines in the 33 Gaudis. There are some, yeah. uh, there are more there there aren't any eights and nines other than my Wagner uh T206 card. Uh it's the only eight that exists that I'm aware of, uh of, of Wagner. I mean, there are others from let's say lesser important players than he. But Gaudi cards are out there. You know, there are people who have full sets of Gaudi cards. One of our viewers, Steve Solomon, tells us the photo for the babe card was taken by the legendary photographer. Charles Conlon. So yeah, it did start oh. with black and white. 
Oh, I remember uh, some, I mean, you guys at the Hall of Fame have a lot of his work, if I'm remembering correctly. Very extensive collection. Yeah. We know, Ken, that this is an extremely valuable, cherished card, but what do you like most about it, just in terms of its aesthetics? Well, you know, I like the art the art more than a pure photograph, to be fair. Um, of course, who among all of us who are, are, are old timers, which I guess I now am, uh, uh, you know, who, who was the most among the most, if not the most legendary player ever was the babe. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, having having a having a babe, uh, a babe card is important. Uh, and, um, you know, this is one of the more iconic babe cards, as are the other two from that same year. You know, yeah. the Gaudi. Uh, let's call them the, the Gaudi tri uh, Babe triplets. Uh, <laughs> so it's just a, yeah, they're, they're, you know, how do cards become uh, more iconic than others uh, when cards are produced every year? Going back, you know, there was a window where cards were not produced, World War II uh, being a, a, an era where cards were not produced because everybody was focused on the world, the, <laughs> the war. But from, Shortly after World War II, like 1948 to present, every year there have been sets of cards produced, and some are just more attractive uh, uh, to the to the market, to the collector, to folks like me that love this, uh, uh, have it as a uh, something that you know kind of is nostalgic uh, in its own way, uh, takes you back to an era before you were alive. In the case of Babe Ruth's career, I. You know, he he deceased shortly after I was born. And so, you know, he wasn't a player I ever got to see, uh, but uh, I admired what he achieved in the game. And I'm proud to have cards that I have a series of Babe Ruth cards in my collection. Very nice. Here we have another uh, Gaudi card. Uh, ah. A connection to Mr. Ruth uh, from the 1934 Gaudi set. We have this Eric card. Um, here we're able to see both the front and the back. And I'm curious, Ken, was it typical for cards of this era, 1930s, to have so much writing on the back of the card? Yeah, they didn't. Uh, cards at a point, I don't know when when this began. I mean, it's part of history that we could we could find out. But, but mostly uh, they just wrote about the player on the back of the card or they had in the earlier days it was purely an advertisement and nothing on the back about the player. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to the tobacco cards, it would be promoting whatever brand of tobacco it was. When Gaudi began, they decided to do these little write-ups on the players. And then as time passed, if you get to the era of the 52 tops, uh, you will see statistical data, a little write-up and uh, performance data on the player. So it was the, yeah, you know, I guess it evolved that the way the companies who produced these cards determined what they would put on a card beyond the image of the player. Yeah, uh, this is a, a, a you know card of which there were two Garys in this uh, set, uh, and I have both of those cards, and and then I have the entire set, uh, uh, you know, in a mid grade for a grade four or five. Uh, but I have these uh, 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 Gehrig cards are the elite uh, cards from that 34 Gaudi set. A couple of things jump out. First, on the back of the card, we see that the uh, sentence or the phrase appears by arrangement with Christy Walsh. Christy Walsh was famously Babe Ruth's agent, but apparently also worked with Lou Gehrig, too. So that's kind of interesting. And then in terms of the front of the card, one of the interesting features that really strikes me are those shadow figures in the background. Um, yeah, interesting. I think it kind of adds to it. And, you know, that's honestly, you're, you're making me look at it and pause and reflect on whether I'd ever really noticed the shadow figures. Yeah, I, I see old Lou Gehrig's smiling face and yeah. uh, that's the, uh, you know, a great image of him, but uh, yeah, I don't know about the shadow figures. I assume that they're kids that are running around and they're yeah. just thrown onto uh, onto the card for effect. 
Um, but I think it works. I think it makes it uh, an intriguing card as if a card of Lou Gehrig by itself. Yeah, and I think that's what these uh, people who, who manufactured these cards tried to do uh, year after year after year. It wouldn't be the same old, same old. There would be some look that the set of cards produced in this era by Gaudi and in later eras by various manufacturers, something that would make that set of cards Let's hope for, for, for them, I'm sure they were hoping more unique, uh, therefore more of the card, you know, because they were selling cards to make money, selling cards. You know, they weren't throwing, uh, you know, they weren't advertising their uh, uh, tobacco company. They were, they were in the card business as Topps was in the card business, as Bowman was in the card business. That's what they did for creating revenue for their company. So they tried uniquely every year to come up with something that would make their cards special. Let's jump ahead to the 1940s. Uh, Here we have an intriguing card of the great Satchel Page. Interestingly listed as Leroy Page, not Satchel. Ken, is this the first card that we know of that depicted Page? Yeah, I think it was his... Um, I, I, you know, somebody would probably know if it was his first year as a major leaguer. Of course, his fame was well established in the old Negro leagues. And I think his first, I think this might have been his first, the leaf card in 48, 49 was the first ever card. And then his other very famous card is the 49 Bowman card. Yeah. Um, uh, where it was the first year they put his image on a card, but he was obviously one of the all-time, all-time greats. And, of course, didn't get to play uh, in his prime as a major leaguer, but he played several years. I know I have a – I think his final year as a player was – I think it was 1953, and there's a – I know I have a 1953 Satchel Page card, uh, uh, a Topps. Uh, and I, I don't recall that he played after that year, but very legendary uh, Hall of Famer now, fortunately. Well, he did he did pitch the one game in 65 with the A's, which go. was See, part publicity stunt. Um, but I part like to deal, I always like to deal with people that know more than I do, and it's really easy <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, but it was just the one game, and there was not obviously a card of him that was uh -huh. the next year because he basically went right back into retirement. One of the reasons Charlie Finley brought him back to pitch that one game, it was to generate publicity, to generate uh, a crowd, but it was also to help uh, Page get more time toward his pension. Uh -huh. uh, I guess, Ken, as to why they went with Leroy instead of Satchel. That's always, I've, I've always been curious about that with this card. Any well, questions? I wasn't around to ask, so I don't know. <laughs> I do know that for almost all of us, we've always known and affectionately referenced him as Satchel Page. And of course, I have the card and I realized his given name was not Satchel. Uh, uh, you know, it was Leroy. And I don't know how that happened versus the later cards were all Satchel. But it's kind of cool to have it. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, it, it was his first ever. And, uh, uh, you know, one looks like he's a happy camper. He's uh, kind of has his eyes almost shut, but smiling nonetheless. Yeah. Do you remember when and how you got this card? Uh, I do not know specifically. Uh, many of the cards, uh, there's uh, a number of cards that I have. Out of the 50, I'm going to say 15-ish of 50 were me acquiring uh, a, a group of cards from Tom Candiotti who had collected mm -hmm. them. I don't know if this was a part of that. I, I would have a file that would tell me. But a good number of my cards have been acquired, like a lot of people who buy cards these days, through the online auction world or through one-off private transactions with a well-known dealer connecting a owner of a card who wishes to sell it to another well-known uh, buyer of cards. I would be, I would be the buyer side of all of that. I have not ever been a seller of cards. Uh, I've sold a couple of cards over my life, but very few. Mm. Uh, I am a real collector 
And part of why I got uh, together with Candiotti, he was going to dispose of this significant collection of very valuable cards. And we worked together and he knew that I was a collector and he came to me and he said, Ken, I'm going to do this. And I'd be honored if you would be interested in buying them because I know you're a real collector and I know most people who would be buying these cards would be buying them to flip them and make a profit. Mm -hmm. And he said, I know that isn't your interest. And this transaction between Tom and me occurred many years ago. And he was correct. I have kept all those cards. You mentioned, Ken, that you like to do the online auctions. What about yes. person auctions? Do you like to go to auctions? Uh, I, I do not. Um, I, I, <laughs> you know, I'm a, a, in an awkward spot to be uh, semi-prominent in the in the baseball world, and and uh, being in 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 an auction, a live one, uh, would just drive the pricing. Uh, mm -hmm. Much of my buying online is done through surrogates. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm not that comfortable with having my name directly involved in 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 the auction world. So I have a couple of people who I have friendships with, who will buy when I'm interested. We will make an arrangement to buy cards, and and they will buy for me. Um, and then on private transactions, of course, I am known by a lot of the let's call them higher end uh, uh, people in the business, the brokers who do auctions. And I'll, 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 I'll deal with a broker directly on a deal, but mostly I try to kind of not get out in the public eye. I mean, I am in the public eye because of this uh, and I'm proud to be uh, because I think I owe it to the baseball community to share what I have. Yeah. Personally, I, I'd love to go to an auction, but I don't think they would let me in. But that might be. <laughs> Why wouldn't they let day. you in? Well, I think they knew. I think they know I didn't have the money. But uh... <laughs> well, let's talk well, about another great are, player from you know, there's uh, the something 19... for everyone at a at a uh, you know you you if they're the online auctions there there's you know I mean to use the retailer you know there's the the Walmart uh, level of auction items and there's the Nordstrom level. Yeah. of items. And so I think one of the cool things about collecting is there's something for everyone. Yeah. And the price points are from really A to Z, to be honest. Absolutely. Collecting is a very personal thing. I do collecting on a different level. I have about yeah. 35,000 cards and they're mostly from the 60s, 70s and 80s. Those are the years that I grew up. Yeah, with perfect. Me, so. Well, it's me starting in the 50s. That was yeah. my first being older than you, that's when I first began, as I said. Yeah. And uh, they were my heroes when I was a boy. Many of them have remained my heroes. As a, And this guy you're showing is a perfect example. He was a prominent superstar player when I was uh, a kid. And he became somebody I, got, I have gotten to know in my life in baseball. In fact, a small world story on Willie mm. is... Um, Willie's elderly these days and doesn't get out a lot, but there was an era when Willie uh, was a Diamondback season ticket holder. Mm. And uh, I got to know him during that time. This goes back, you know, into the early 2000s. And he, uh, the Giants trained here and he continued to have an association with the team and would come over during the spring. And he had family who lived here. He had a home. And uh, he bought season tickets to the Diamondback games. And, you know, I have some photos with uh, uh, Ken and Willie. Uh, I have some, uh, I have a modest collection of signed baseballs. And uh, one of them is signed by, by Willie. Uh, I only collect baseballs from people, ball players that I, that I have, well, with the exception of Babe Ruth mm -hmm. uh, and Sada Haro O, every collectible ball that I have signed by one single signed ball is from a player that I have personally known. Mm. Some are now deceased, sadly, but, you know, we're living legends and, and people because of my uh, good fortune to be in the game, I've, I, I got to meet and spend time with over the years. I was going to ask you if you'd had a chance to meet Willie. Obviously, you know him very well. What's he like on a person-to-person -person basis? Well, he's a very, you know, uh, and, and me knowing him as an older gentleman, 
uh, you know, very uh, enjoyable guy to visit with socially. Came to, uh, the first time we ever met. He came to my, uh, during the spring, came to the Diamondback offices with a family member. Mm. Uh, and and uh, we met and sat and chatted. And, of course, I'm starstruck by who he was and who he is because uh, he's still with us. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, a very, a very nice gentleman. I mean, he, I'm, I'm rarely ask anybody for these kinds of things, but I did, uh, Willie, can I have my photo made with you? And he was very gracious mm. standing in my office and getting a photo done. And, you know, Willie, would you, <laughs> would you sign a ball for me? And he did. <laughs> and okay. it's not something I usually would ask, <laughs> but I did. So obviously a hero. Willie Mays, our oldest living Hall of Famer, age yeah. 91. Uh, this is his 1951 Bowman card. It is regarded as the only true Mays rookie card. Ken, for me, two things really jump out about the card. Number one, it's done in the landscape or horizontal format, which I love. Yeah. Also, a minimum of written words. All we see is his name, Willie Mays. I think that's yes. pretty cool, too. Yeah, it's just the way Bowman chose to do it that year. Those cards haven't become as iconic a set of cards as maybe they would because the Bowman company kind of went away in the mid-50s. They reemerged at a later time, but they they were, you know, mono a mono competitors with Tops, And Tops kind of won the war uh, of, of competition, and Bowman kind of faded. And therefore, their cards are not as valuable as Topps cards on a year-to-year -year basis. Still beautiful, though, and still wonderful. Yeah, it's one of my favorite cards. And, uh, uh, you know, I have uh, several Willie cards in the collection. Uh, uh, some that are, uh, you know, the only card of the grade, you know, which is always the collector's dream, if you're a collector like me, that you have, uh, you know, one of. Yeah. Nobody else has one. You have the only one. Yeah. Well, just three years after this 51 Bauman, we have the Hank Aaron rookie card from Topps 1954. Uh, again, a couple of things that really jump out. The colors in the background, but also on the Milwaukee Braves cap really stand out to me. Uh, you've got him listed. I think it's interesting as Henry Aaron, and he also – signs as Henry Aaron. Yeah. It's a beautiful card. What do you like most about this one? Well, first, of course, I like the fact that it's his rookie card and it's the highest graded card that exists. But I like the fact that I got to know him mm. and uh, had a really, really wonderful ex uh, uh, experience with him when he was honored some years ago uh, in Mobile, Alabama, where he grew up. And his boyhood home was uh, th uh, there in uh, uh, in downtown Mobile, and we were the they were our double uh, the Diamondbacks Double A affiliate at the time. And the community decided to honor Hank by restoring his home and making it a museum on the edge of the ballpark. Hmm. And so they had a weekend of events, and I had the good fortune of being invited to be a part of it. And Hank and Billy were there and we spent three days uh, with him being me being kind of on the on the sidelines and uh, having a big smile on my face and Hank being honored. Uh, and I got to know him in that setting. And he absolutely one of the most pristine, wonderful, gentlemanly uh, people I have ever known in the game of baseball and a remarkable wife. Um uh, very, very wonderful couple and uh, very much involved in philanthropic work and back in Atlanta, you know, where he, of course, uh, played a good part of his, his career and ended up being a part of the Atlanta Braves organization until he passed. And uh, so another guy, uh, I love his card. I love that it's the Jim Mint 10 rookie card, but, I, but he was a guy that I admired and got to know personally. You know, for someone who was such a great player, remarkably humble. Oh, indeed. Spoken. I mean, as great a player as he was, his personality was almost that of a utility infielder. And I don't want people to take it the wrong way, but 
he was a guy that seemed happy to just sort of melt into the background, not talk about himself much. Yeah, he, he was certainly not a self-promoter as, as, you know, that wouldn't be a fair way to even define uh, uh, most players. But, but uh, you know, there were a few that would be defined as that. I could name some names and I won't. But, but Hank was like you describing him. He was an extremely humble, genteel person would be how you would describe him as genteel. Yeah. Another great card from the 54 set, ah. also a rookie card, Al Kaline. Uh, I don't have many cards from this set. In fact, I have mostly reproductions. I think it's a beautiful set, though. This Is this one of your favorites? Yeah, that 54 set, you know, if I had to look at tops, the two most favorite sets of tops cards for me are the 52s and the 54s. Wow. Uh, Kaline, as it happened, uh, my my long deceased dad was a Tiger fan. Uh, for part of his life, he was a Reds fan, and Kaline was his favorite player. And I remember when he was a rookie. You know, of course, 1954. I'm a ten year old, and of course, you're sort of identified with your dad in that era. What did your dad like? Well, you liked what he liked mostly. I think most of us could say that would be true. And my dad loved baseball. He loved Al Kaline. He loved the Tigers. And so having that, you know, again, Jim Mint 10 Al Kaline rookie card is is a prize in my collection. Did you have a chance to meet him, get to know him at all? Uh, he is not. Unfortunately, he recently passed. And, and I one of my favorite people in my history in baseball uh, is Kirk Gibson. Mm. And he had a career with the Tigers. He had a career with the Dodgers as Many would remember this great, famous hotel, uh, home run he hit uh, years ago. And then he had a career with the Diamondbacks, where he was our manager. And Kirk is now a broadcaster. He's from the uh, Detroit area. Uh, and he, he had always told me, you know, you can come up sometime and I'll have you meet Kaline. Mm. And sadly, I'll pass and I never did, got to do that. Yeah, I remember we lost him that with that. Very difficult year it was not only the start of the pandemic, but it was a year I believe we lost 10 Hall of Famers and Al was the first one to pass away. That Yeah, year. and being on being on the board, you know, you're identified as uh, uh, as a member of that board and a part of the baseball, greater baseball family, the Hall of Fame family. And it really is that, you know, these Hall of Famers are really a part of a larger family than, uh, uh, and that's how it's thought of. And so I remember it was a, a, a probably as dark a year as the hall of fame has experienced. And in, in my time around, uh, where we lost a number of very, very, very important, uh, uh, figures in the game. Absolutely. Uh, Kaline, much like Hank Aaron, very humble person. Um, yeah, not a flashy player, but a great player. In many ways, he was kind of the Roberto Clemente of the American League, very similar uh, to the great Clemente. Um, here's a card, 1968 Rookie Stars from the top set. Uh, it's the first split card we're talking about. We have a rookie card for both Jerry Kuzman and Nolan Ryan. Of course, uh, the greater player being Nolan. Kuzman was a terrific pitcher, too. Ken, I'm curious, when a great player... Yeah, I guess, Jerry, you know, they... they were, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Split uh, card, does that does that affect the card's value in any way, or is you that know, I, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to answer the question. I know this card is very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's partly valuable because this particular card uh, is uh, is the only Jim Mint ten card, mm. and Jim Mint ten always is the most highest grade you can get. And even though this was 1968, there is only one. Yeah. And and I'm fortunate to own it. I also, again, Nolan is a guy I got to know. Uh, 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 he was involved uh, in the ownership uh, side of baseball, came to owners meetings. He has a son, Reed Ryan, who was president uh, of the Houston Astros uh, that I got to know and uh, you know consider a dear friend. And the dad's a very fine man. And uh, uh you know, he was obviously among the very, very greatest of all pitchers, has records that will never be broken. Uh, the most no-hitters ever by a pitcher. 
uh, most strikeouts ever by a pitcher, uh, uh, Cy Young's, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I don't know if Nolan's card would be a single Nolan card as a rookie. Of course, there are many Nolan cards that were single Nolan cards. Would this card be worth, would he, his rookie be worth more than it is? Well, it's very, very valuable in the present circumstance. Perhaps one of the reasons why it is so hard to find this card in excellent or, in you, as you say, perfect 10 condition, it has that speckled border that Topps used in 68. Yeah. And I happen and, to love and, the speckled and, border. It looks great, but it's hard to keep in good shape. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it, you know, in the, in the grading, which I'm, I'm sure many on, on this call, if they're collectors would know, they, they, they get under magnifying glasses and micro, uh, microscopes to grade and they look for any imperfection at all. And this card in particular, um, you know, was one where it, it would be easy to see an imperfection on the corners yeah. and therefore, it would be graded down as a result. And there are, there is only one 10. There are just a very few nines. And then, you know, there are a lot of eights uh, because it's, you know, from the sixties and not the thirties. But, uh, uh, you know, Lenola, I remember when first I saw Nolan Ryan pitch when he was a rookie for the Miracle Mets against my then beloved Baltimore Orioles. Hmm. Uh, so I go way back with Nolan. Yeah. You know, I remember Nolan in his heyday with the angels, the Astros, the Rangers. I don't ever remember him being as thin though, as he was when he was. Yeah, I, I've, I, 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 uh, he's certainly not that thin today, but who, who in the middle to later ages is as thin as they once were. <laughs> Very true. I'm Very certainly true. not. <laughs> <laughs> Couple you more know, I have a cute little, I have a cute and... little add-on story about Nolan Ryan because sure. I think we all would that are fans would remember when did you ever when did you get the first baseball you ever got from a major leaguer? Now I think mo most of us as fans who ever got a baseball given to them by a major leaguer would remember who gave it to you, mm -hmm. and 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 I got my first ever ball given to me by a cup of coffee uh, relief pitcher for the Milwaukee Braves by the name of Red Murph. And I'll bet you some on the call, and, and maybe you know, what was what made Red Murph ultimately famous? Became a scout, right? Yeah, and who was his most famous player that he signed? Well, it's got to be Ryan, correct? That would be correct. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so as a little boy... I got a card from Murph and here, here we are all these many, many, many years later, he became a very famous person because of his scouting prowess and Nolan became one of the most famous Hall of Famers of all time. So you, you sort of feel these connections in, sure. in a way and that's part of what collecting is all about. I think feeling connections to something you loved and that I still do and that's the game and the players make the game. <laughs> couple more cards to talk about, and these are certainly uh, 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 the premier cards. Um, one of the most desired of all time, the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle. This is a photo of the actual card. You can see at the top where the grading is. It says the D-backs collection. How yeah. did you acquire this one? It, it was to his everlasting chagrin. I got it from Tom Candiotti. Wow. Uh, and and uh, I wouldn't throw him or me under the bus as to what the value of the card was back those many, many years ago, as I was buying a group of cards and he had allocated dollars to each, this was the most valuable that he owned. Mm. And uh, let's say today's world, uh, it's, it was an oil well that had uh, a, a, an oil well that had not yet been drilled and mm. it came in as a gusher. And I'm very, very proud to have it because it has become one of the two most valuable, most iconic of all baseball cards, the Honus Wagner card and the Mickey Mantle 52 tops, not the Mantle rookie card, uh, which I also got from Candiotti. Mm. 
the Bowman card from 1951. And the mantle that I have is one of three Jim Mint 10 mantles. And the Bowman card is a one of card. And of course, Mantle was iconic in all kinds of ways. I never did meet him, unfortunately. I did see him play in person, though. I remember it vividly going to Yankee Stadium many years ago when he was still a player uh, in the 60s. Uh, but a card I'm very proud to own. Were you shocked when you heard earlier this year that one of these mantle cards went for $12 million plus at auction? No, I, 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 you know, if you're in the if you're in the game like I am, and you're regularly engaged with the network of people who are the dealers and the brokers and the auction house, uh, you kind of have a sense for value mm. as to where where the market is, and I know where the market appears to be for this mantle card and its brothers, the other two. And uh, the other card, uh, uh, you know, deserved the money. That the, I've got to meet the gentleman. Uh, I've not met him in person. We've met via uh, a text and who, who owned that other card, and it was a nine, uh, not a, a not a PSA nine. Uh, PSA carries a little higher value uh, than its competitor grading companies generally do. Not that they're not good at grading. It's just, you know, it's probably the, the, uh, the premier grading company is PSA. Yeah. And uh, the other card was graded by a competitor and it brought, as you have noted, it's publicly known 12 and a half million bucks and good for the gentleman who owned it. I'm blanking on his name, but it's his name's out there in the public eye now. Of course, the 52 sets significant in that it was really the first successful set for tops. Yes. That one set had been somewhat of a disaster, didn't work out. Uh, but Cy Berger and uh, Woody yeah. Gelman, his artistic director, uh, sat down at the drawing table. They came up with a design that you see here with the team logo, a space for the facsimile signature, uh, colorized drawing of the player. And that essentially became the prototype for what we now. Yeah, know the, it, it is the cards. most successful year of tops in terms of that set of cards is, is the most iconic. And one of my other, which is not a part of the collection that we're, we're talking about and not a part of the book, I do have a full set of, of 52 tops. And uh, unfortunately for me, I'm in the, uh, uh, the comparative I would give you is uh, in the rental car world, there was Hertz and Avis. And I'm Avis. I'm number two. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a gentleman I know uh, uh, who has the number one graded car uh, set of all time, 52 tops. I have the number two set of all time. And we are outliers to the rest of those who have collected the full set of cards from 52 tops. There are many very fine collections that have full sets of tops 52s but our, our two collections are outliers. And of course, the ultimate holy grail of baseball yeah. card collecting, the T206 Hannes Wagner. Uh, we all know, of course, about its monetary value. One of these Wagner cards once went at auction for $6.5 million, roughly half of that mantle price. Ken, aside from the monetary value, what do you like about the aesthetics of this card? Well, I mean, it's from one, the the... T206 set, you know, which is again an iconic set. These are even smaller than the traditional cards, you know. So we looked at the very large cabinet size card. Now we're talking about very tiny cards, half the size of, you know, the mantle card that we just look at in terms of physical size. Uh, uh, that era uh, contained the T206s, of which this is a part, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was the members of the first class of Hall of Famers all were card, uh, you know, and I have them all uh, uh, in, in my collection. Uh, uh, the Walter Johnsons, the Ty Cobbs, the Christy Mathesons, et cetera. Uh, uh, Wagner being the most rare of, of those cards and one of the brotherhood of the original Hall of Famers, a very, very great player. And 
for a variety of reasons, there were fewer Cobb cards, therefore more valuable because of scarcity. And this particular card is an outlier in terms of its grade. It is a grade eight, and there is only one five and only one, um, well, more than one, but three or four threes. So, mm -hmm. and there are only about 30 cards known to exist in, in any grade from grade authentic, which is below grade one, uh, uh, up to this card being way the outlier as a grade eight. Yeah. So I like the fact that it's an outlier and that I have it, <laughs> I guess. <Yeah. laughs> Very nice. Uh, the Pittsburgh without the H always jumps out at me. Uh, the colors are also very vivid, um, yeah. and it's just, uh, it is a remarkable It's very card. vibrant. You know, the colors yeah. of this card are very, very vibrant. And and I also like, you know, there's those who would collect, uh, uh, many would know that this has uh, kind of the legend about it of all of the things related there too with some chicanery involved in a prior day uh, of uh, previous to my ownership and all that. It sort of adds to the mystery of the card, uh, the, the uh, kind of the soap opera-esque elements surrounding it. I like all of that. Yeah. Uh, it's got a great story about it. Ken, we have just a couple of minutes left, but I do want to get some quick thoughts on your connection to the Hall of Fame. Sure. So back in 2010, the Hall of Fame featured this temporary exhibit, the ultimate set featuring a number of your cards what did that mean to you, knowing that items from your collection were being displayed so prominently here in Cooperstown? Well, I was proud to be able to do it. I was asked uh, uh, at the time uh, by uh, Jeff Idelson, who was then uh, your president, a uh, long time as the president, prior to my, my uh, one of my former right-hand people with the Diamondbacks, the new president, Josh Rowich. Uh, but, uh, Jeff and I got to know each other and, and, uh, he asked me, would I consider, uh, doing a loan and that they would do a special exhibit and they did. And it's called, what was it called? The ultimate, uh, the ultimate set, I think, uh, if I'm reading that, I'm, I'm remembering it now, but it was a loan of my cards over a, a two year, uh, two to three year period, uh, that allowed you know, everybody who came to the Hall of Fame during that time, which is many, many, many thousands of people, got to see all of these cards. Yeah. And it was a way to bring it to the home of home of our game, uh, uh, you know, the, the museum that honors the game, I think better than any sports museum honors its heroes. Uh, Cooperstown does that. And I was very proud to have the cards there. Uh, uh, my son was quite young at the time. And I got to bring him there and be with his dad to see the collection on display and got to get a special tour of the, uh, you know, if you will, the, the, the white glove tour, you call it, uh, where you, you go beyond, be, be beyond the museum into the, into the stacks yeah. and you get to hold relics. Uh, yeah, that was all pretty special to me. It was, uh, I was proud to be able to do it. We do still have a couple of your cards on loan. Yeah. 206 Eddie Plank and a 1954 uh, Bauman, Ted Williams. So we should mention that. Um, Want to mention, though, also your involvement as part of the Hall of Fame's board of directors. Uh, sure. You joined the board two years ago. Why is this important to you? Why do you take on well, that option? I, I mean, I think in, in a simple, short answer, look, uh, it, 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 it is what what I've already described it to be, the Hall of Fame itself. Uh, the board is made up of, of a good number of its members are the great are great living Hall of Famers, you know, who are giving back of their time to be on the board. And some of us, let's call it lesser baseball people, get to join with them, uh, spending time with the, you know, Cal Ripkins and the Brooks Robinsons and the Ozzie Smiths and others that are the uh, members of the hall, uh, of the board is a, a great fun thing. Being able to be a part of these panel of selectors that we augment the writers on selecting out of uh, players that didn't make the Hall of Fame out of the uh, writers vote and now are revisited in their later lives. I mean, I was a part of a panel that got to vote on only 16 people got to vote 
I happen to be one mm -hmm. in the setting where, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we, we were able to uh, uh, vote and elect our incredibly legendary uh, person, Buck O'Neill, to the Hall of Fame. It sure makes you feel good that you were one who got to vote on Buck O'Neill being a Hall yeah. of Famer. So it's way more of a give, baseball giving back to me than me giving back to baseball. But I love it. Uh, I enjoy the meetings. I enjoy the associations. Uh, you know, we're trying to grow the Hall of Fame, make it all the more successful. It is very successful. I love coming to Cooperstown. What an incredible community. It's Norman Rockwell's hometown, in my opinion. Nice. <laughs> Now, some on your call wouldn't remember Norman Rockwell, but older guys like me do. <laughs> well, I certainly do. I love Norman Rockwell. We actually did a program on Norman Rockwell's baseball art earlier this year. A uh, final point. I want you to tell people about the artifact that's behind you, which is obviously very meaningful. It has to do oh. with Arizona Diamondbacks. Give people a sense of uh, what's uh, sitting behind you in your office. Well, I'm not able to see what you're seeing, but uh, on my credenza behind me, uh, I guess I would say is one of my favorite collectibles. I didn't yeah. earn it. Others did, but I got one, and that's a World Series trophy, and it was earned by the Diamondbacks in 2001, beating those uh, the hated Yankees. I probably have lost part of the audience by saying that, but now, I, I say that affectionately. They were the iconic multi-year in a row uh, winners of the World Series. And we were the upstarts in 2001. And fortunately, we won. And I have a ring and a trophy to show for it. And I'm very proud to keep it in my, in my trophy in my home. <laughs> and the trophy does stay out. You don't put it in a vault. Uh, I keep it out. It's one, you know, there are several of them. It isn't the trophy. The trophy is on display at Chase Field, which it's where it should be. This is a replica of, of, of it. it's, it's valuable, but it's not as valuable as most of these cards. It's, uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to lose it. I wouldn't want somebody to come and take it away, <laughs> but I'm glad to have it. Our guest has been Ken Kendrick. Uh, this new book, a terrific coffee table book, The Diamondbacks Collection, uh, features all the cards that we've been talking about extensively today. Uh, you can find the book at our website. Here's a screenshot, a shop.baseballhall.org. Again, shop.baseballhall.org. And if you do give a gift membership to the Hall of Fame, you will receive a complimentary copy of the book. Ken, we really appreciate your time and your contribution to the Hall of Fame as uh, not only a collector, but also now as a member of the Board of Directors. We thank you. Thank you, Bruce. It's fun, uh, fun to chat with you. It really brings back, you know, when you look at these cards like we just have, you know, uh, 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 great memories for a lifetime for me. Ken Kendrick, principal owner of the Arizona Diamondbacks, one of the great baseball card collectors in the world. We appreciate his time. We appreciate your time as well. We hope you've enjoyed virtual voices of the game. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.